you by the American Hospital Association's Physician Leadership Forum. To present today's session, we are pleased to have with us Tara Sotlow, Director of Client Solutions at the Leadership Development Group, and Margaret Carey, founder of the Carey Group Global. With that, let me turn it over to Dr. Carey, who will get us started. Hi, my name is Maggie Carey, Margaret Carey, whatever you wish to call me, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, I trained as a physician and had a number of different jobs and now work as an executive coach and storytelling is a critical part of leadership development. So from here we go to Tara. Yes, hello everyone. I'm Tara Sattlow, Director of Client Solutions at the Leadership Development Group. And my story, by way of background, is I'm a psychologist turned executive coach turned organizational development consultant and I've had the pleasure of working exclusively in healthcare over the course of my career. Next slide, please. So why listen to us? What unique perspectives do Maggie and I bring to the table, and how can we offer you value in partnership during this presentation? In speaking for myself, I use narrative theory as the framework for my doctoral dissertation, in my psychotherapy process, in my executive coaching practice, and in my current role as a management consultant. It's how I conceptualize organizational dynamics and interventions, and for me, it's a mindset, a lens through which I view the world. What's the narrative that's being created in any moment in time, like right now? What will the story of facilitating this webinar with Maggie be? Will I perceive it as going well? Will I only focus on the things I forgot to say? Will I perceive the experience of this webinar the same way you, the audience, does? We can't step out of our story. It's always in process, but we can shift how we narrate it. So to me, storytelling is a mindset. And Maggie? Great. Thanks, Tara. So what I keep getting, uh, what I keep learning with my coaching clients and with the work I do in storytelling is this is a critical piece. In coaching, it's off for yourself. It's often, what is the story you're telling yourself about yourself? So like Tara, I'm wondering, am I going to stumble on words? Am I going to um, be a star? I have no idea what's going to happen, but we'll all give it our best shot. And I think what happens is with many of my clients, it's about creating the stories to motivate the people they work with. It's also creating stories to show the mission of the work they're doing. Patient care is, of course, full of stories. and that's one of the parts that people like about what we do. So I'm sort of wondering as we work with this, what are the stories you're going to tell and who is your audience? Great. So learning objectives. Very briefly, here are our learning objectives for today. We're going to take a look at the science and research of storytelling, practical tools, technique, techniques and tips, and how stories enhance team engagement, purpose, and connection. And here's how we're going to do it. Um, we're going to first look at the science and research behind meaning making and storytelling, why storytelling, the importance of emotion in storytelling, five P's, story arc, and four places to use storytelling. So let's start with the science. As human beings, we are natural meaning makers. Our brain instinctively seeks to instill meaning in abstraction to make order out of chaos. We just can't tolerate ambiguity. So you might remember if you took a course in experimental psychology, the concept of gestaltism or gestalt psychology, an attempt to understand the laws behind the ability to acquire and maintain meaningful perceptions in an apparently chaotic world. The central principle of gestalt psychology is that the mind forms a unified or meaningful whole. So take a look at this ink blot. What do you see? People see different things in their efforts to make meaning out of this ambiguous shape. So I'd like you to take just a moment to type your answers into the chat box on what you see. Yeah, so we're starting to see some great things. We see bat, we see masquerade max, mask, two foxes, butterfly. People see um, 
the two witches on a broom, lots of different things that people see here. So we have some <laughs> great brains working among us, and your brains have been actively working to create a whole, to instill meaning out of chaos. And we do this with everything, not just ink blocks. So what do you see here? Or here? Or here? These are clouds, tiny drops of water, ambiguous stimuli, and yet our brain is unconsciously at work to instill meaning in them. My connectivity is going in and out, so if somebody could just, oops, I got it now. Great. And as um, our brain works hard to perceive and make meaning, I'm sure many of you have seen this one before. Do you see an old woman or a young woman in this illustration? They're both present, but you'll not be able to see both of them simultaneously. Once you perceive both figures, see if you can get them to fluctuate back and forth between the two interpretations. So what's going on here? This type of rever reversible figure concerns the meaningful content of what is interpreted by your brain from the same static image. Your perception of each figure tends to remain stable until you attend to different regions or contours. Certain regions and contours tend to favor one perception, others the alternative. Perception is indeed reality, and our brain works hard to seek it. We seek meaning in everything. And because we are meaning makers, we are natural storytellers. And we've been sharing stories with each other as a primary method of communication for over 40,000 years. Or so the story goes, the tradition of storytelling began with cave paintings. And it has been going strong ever since. For years, civilizations have used stories as a way to make sense of the world around them. Stories about how the world was created, how people were created, stories about heroes, tragedies, and rules to live by. We see these stories in ancient Greek mythology and across all religions. In these early societies, there was no writing, and yet people miraculously managed to pass on these oral accounts generation after generation. How about that? My connectivity keeps going in and out. Oh no. Okay. And we still do this today. Think about the front page of a newspaper. What is the story that it's trying to tell? Of all the infinite events happening around the world, which ones get chosen for the front page? What's the message? What's the intent? Think about the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Breitbart News, the Chicago Tribune. Different papers, different storytellers. And we do it ourselves, daily, by the minute, sometimes by the second with our incessant status updates. We have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, our company websites. We are telling a story about our personal lives, our professional lives, our unique brand, what image are we trying to convey? What message? What are we trying to influence? What impact and effect are we knowingly and unknowingly having? Stories are powerful. Hmm. As human beings, we are natural meaning makers and storytelling. It's what distinguishes us from other species. As Jonathan Gottschall so eloquently lays out in his 2012 book, The Storytelling Animal, how stories make us human. We live in landscapes of make-believe. We spin fantasies. We devour novels and films and plays. Even sporting events and criminal trials unfold as narratives. Human beings are clearly wired for story, but why? Gottschall argues that stories help us navigate life's complex social problems, just as a flight simulator prepares pilots for different 
difficult situations. Storytelling has evolved like other behaviors to ensure our survival. It gives us the opportunity to safely experiment, anticipate, and work things out. Drawing on the latest research in neuroscience, psychology, and evolutionary biology, Gottschall explains what it means to be a storytelling animal. Did you know that the more absorbed you are in a story, the more it changes your behavior? That all children act out the same kinds of stories, whether they grow up in the inner city or the outer suburbs? That people who read more fiction are more empathic? Stories teach us how to live, whether explicitly or implicitly, and bind us together around common values. So let's take a look at a few research studies that tested stories. As we all know and have experienced, a story sticks in our mind and lasts much longer than, say, a list of facts or information. But why does a story stick with us long after it concludes? Why are we able to repeat a joke or share a compelling story again and again? When we receive basic information, say a shopping list, we process the language within two areas of our brain, named after two neuroscientists, Broca's area and Wernicke's area. When we read our shopping list, these two areas of the brain get activated. The list hits our language processing center and decodes words into meaning. And basically, nothing else happens. Our brain acknowledges the new data, has been processed, and that's it. But when you add storytelling into the mix, the brain behaves differently. Neuroscientists have researched the different areas of the brain that respond to information by using MRIs to scan the brain's response. One such study conducted by a group of researchers at Emory University in 2012 discovered that when participants read a descriptive metaphor rather than plain text, the sensory receptors in the cortex lit up. Our sensory cortex is responsible for registering actual physical things that happen to us, like the smell of popcorn or the way sandpaper feels. And according to the study, metaphors like the singer had a velvet voice and he had leathery hands actually roused the sensory cortex. But phrases matched for meaning, like the singer had a pleasing voice and he had strong hands, did not. The bottom line here is that storytelling appears to illuminate the same part of our brain that gets activated when we encounter an actual physical sensory experience. We appear to understand the rich detail and action of a story in a more complex way than if we were simply processing pieces of information, like items on a shopping list. If I could have someone advance to slide 17. I'm not sure. So we just learned that the sensory cortex gets lit up during storytelling. But what mechanisms take place when we hear a story and we have a hook for it? That is, the story ends up engaging us and possibly even influencing our attitudes, beliefs, and or actions. The next study from Hamby, Brinberg, and Dinolowski in 2017 comes from a body of research in psychology, marketing, and communications that focuses on understanding the persuasive influence of narratives. Transportation theory describes a process of narrative persuasion entail, entailing emotional engagement, generation of mental imagery, which means the sensory cortex is lighting up like a Christmas tree, and attention to a story. Transportation into a story activates a process of retrospective reflection in which the story makes one reflect on one's own past experiences. So if a story is engaging enough that I'm transported into it, then I start reflecting on my own past experiences. And spoiler alert to the findings of the study, I'm more inclined to have my attitudes, beliefs, and or actions persuaded. Okay, so true story, which is probably not much of a surprise because how can I co-facilitate a storytelling webinar without telling one? But last week, I was in Houston, Texas, at one of our leadership development programs. And our presenter was talking about leading change. And as any compelling presenter would do, he asked us to think about a time when we were leading a change effort and it went well. So I, along with the four other people at my table, started buzzing with stories about work-related change efforts that had gone really well. And we all found that no, no matter what the example was, we had common themes. How we gathered input from our team members, 
focus on why the change would make things better for the people we serve in our organization, exercised flexibility, open-mindedness, empathy, and celebrated every success along the way. The presenter then asked us to think about a time when the change effort had not gone so well, and I couldn't think of a single work example, not because I didn't have one, I have many, but because I could not get the image of my 13-year-old son out of my head and the recent struggle I was having with him related to him doing his homework. How I had approached my change effort of getting my 13-year-old son to get more serious and start studying the way I thought he should study, which essentially means in how I studied, in a quiet room, allocating at least an hour a block at a time, reading and rereading the materials, etc. It was an absolute leading change failure. I was top down in my approach. I didn't gather his input. I didn't care about his input. I felt that I knew better than he did. And no surprise, it failed miserably. So when the presenter had us tell our stories about changes that had gone well, I was transported into the story. I was fully engaged. And this activated a process of retrospective reflection into my recent dealings with my son. And I vowed silently in that moment that when I returned back to Boston, I would approach doing homework with my son differently. So this past Sunday, when my son announced he had a quiz coming up in school on Tuesday, I turned to my husband and said, you know, I'll take the lead on this one. And so embracing the opportunity to try something different, I asked my son how he wanted to approach studying. And after getting over the shock of my question, he came up with a plan of studying for three 30-minute blocks of time on Sunday at 12.30, 3.30, and then at 5.30, in his room with the music on loudly. And instead of rereading the chapters, he was just going to write down the main ideas. So I'm delighted to report that the story has a happy ending and that my son got a 95 on his English quiz. The homework tension between the two of us had just decreased significantly, at least for the time being, and most importantly, he had a renewed sense of confidence and pride in his abilities. It just goes to show how a compelling story that resonates personally can spark considerable change in beliefs and behaviors. And then finally, if someone could just advance to the next slide, in a third study, Witt, Das, and Vet in 2008 set out to examine what has a stronger persuasive effect on at-risk behavior, objective statistics or a personal testimonial. In an experimental online study, the researchers compared the effects of different types of persuasive evidence in promoting the acceptance of a personal health risk in a sample of 118 men at risk for infection with hepatitis B virus. And they found that perceptions of personal risk and intention to obtain vaccination against HBV were highest after presentation of narrative evidence compared to statistical evidence. So what we learned from these three studies is that storytelling, A, stimulates the brain, B, when compelling and personally relevant, can change our beliefs and behaviors, and C, can be more persuasive than statistics. So simply said, storytelling can be a powerful mechanism for engaging and inspiring your team. But how do you do this in healthcare? And more importantly, how do you do this in healthcare really well? So with that said, it's my pleasure to hand the mic over to Maggie. Well, hi. So here's my biggest fear, that we're going to revert back to the opening slide during my presentation. So bear with us. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about tools, techniques, and tips for how to actually do this. And so the first thing I'd like to say is, Pretend I want you to imagine you're sitting in a room, it's grand rounds, and you're listening to somebody tell you about the importance of electronic health records. And I would imagine that in the beginning, you're thinking, okay, improve quality of care, and then blah, 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 blah. And then by the next one, strengthen patient safety, your interest is starting to flag. So by the time you get to the bottom, you're not really paying attention and you revert to the Z's on the right. I didn't do anything, I promise, I didn't do anything. <laughs> so, um, okay, let's go to the next slide. So, next slide, one more. 
Okay, so let me tell this is Adobe Canyon. This is um, Sugarloaf Bridge State Park at the end of Adobe Canyon Road in Kenwood, California, which is just outside Santa Rosa and where I lived during my residency, family medicine residency in Santa Rosa. And this was a fabulous place, not the least of which because I lived on it. The last, the last picnic I went with my dad when he was still alive was here at this park. And so when I ended up renting a place on the creek, I was thrilled. And I had the best landlords. They were named the Moolins. Lorraine had been quite a looker in her younger years. And Bob was about in his 80s and, and quite a raconteur. He had been a liquor deliverer, a liquor dealer. He was a manager. And they were sort of like surrogate parents for me as my parents died and got sick. And Bob got, Lorraine got demented, and Bob got macular degeneration. They moved to Folsom, California, to be near their only son. And as Rain, Lorraine became increasingly demented, she was put into a house, a home, assisted living facility. And Bob, because of his macular degeneration, couldn't drive. So he had to take three different buses to get to her. And I got a call. I would visit them whenever I turned whenever I was in the Bay Area, and Bob, again, they were like parents to me, and just visiting them made all of us really happy. So I got a call from their son, Yale, who said, Dad's seeing spiders. And I flew out, and Dad, his father was in the hospital. So I flew out immediately. I lived in Denver, flew out immediately. And as my plane was landing in Oakland, Bob died. And next slide, please. This is a picture of Amy, their granddaughter, one of two. And she was a, was a medical student, an honors medical student at UCLA at the time. And she and I went through the chart as we had not, not the written chart, but as we had recalled it. And we figured out that Bob had been given some antibiotics for some infection and eventually went into failure, went into liver failure. And he wasn't, his doctors uh, sent him to a nursing home. And when he got there, they realized he was yellow and sent him back. And this was not a question about money, because they were well insured and had enough money to pay for this. But what happened was he didn't get any kind of blood work to see how the antibiotics were affecting his organs. And he died most likely of liver failure caused by medical, by medical error. And so I tell you that story because most of the time, the stories we tell are much more compelling for, in this case, the electronic health record. Because I believe that if this organization had had an electronic health record, it would have decreased his chances of dying because there would have been some kind of a system to fail safe. So um, let's go to the next slide, please. Besides, sort of have a life of their own. It's very interesting. So why use storytelling in healthcare? The most important piece, the most obvious piece, is to really share stories of extraordinary patient care and then some substandard patient care for what goes wrong so we can learn from each other the stories really put a face on the performance metrics and also motivate caregivers to act um, when you can tell a story. Dr. Alan Weiss, who's the president and CEO of NH NCH Healthcare System in Florida, has a weekly newsletter, Straight Talk, that he uses to share stories about excellence in patient care and about new physicians, other colleagues joining the system. I have a newsletter I send out, which also has stories in it. And most, Mayo has a newsletter. And so the the stories included in the newsletter help to build your brand and help to build the understanding of what you're doing. You can share knowledge and solutions. You capture your audience's attention. And you can actually energize people to do something. Next slide, please. The three, this is from Donald Davis, who's a storyteller extraordinaire. And you might Google him. He has a, very, he has a number of different books. And what he talks about are the five Ps for good storytelling, people, places, the problem they're dealing with, and the progress toward a solution, and illustrate 
by painting pictures for your audience, whether in words or by showing it to them. Next slide, please. Oops, back one. This is a story arc. And I put it on the left, because you can see in general what happens is there's a static system. And then there's a rising action in the story. There's a climax, falling action, and then there's resolution of the problem. And if you look to the right, you can understand why I put Big Bad Wolf as what I saw with that ink blot test. So the Red Riding Hood comes in. She meets the wood. Nearly gets eaten, she's saved, and then she's safe, and she learns a valuable lesson. And that's what storytelling is. Tara mentioned we've been doing this for eons. The story t stories are how we passed information one, from one generation to the next. So what kinds of stories can you think of to engage your team or to engage your administrators? You can use storytelling. Um, so an action, a rising action, could be the mandate for value-based care, say, from payers, or resistance from clinicians, anxiety from administrators. And the climax could be chaos and confusion with this decreasing until resolution. Again, what stories can you think of? Next, next slide, please. One of the most powerful stories I ever told was one I kept hidden for a long time. I had a patient, Mr. C, during residency. And I was, he was probably in his 50s, seemed like an old man to me then, not so much now. He'd come in with his hair done, perfect, perfect suit, um, cleanly shaven, smelling of aftershave. And we had sort of this friendship going on. He had a decreasing hematocrit or blood count. And I didn't, I kind of didn't really pay that much attention. I didn't know what to do. And this was a first year resident. And when I, I moved to another location after I finished, and he called me. Um, and sure, I took the call. It was you know, Mr. C, whom I knew. And he said, Dr. Carey, I just want you to know the reason my blood count was dropping is because I have colon cancer. I'd failed to do a rectal on him, which was the standard of care at the time, for a number of different reasons. I'm not sure, but I think part of it was embarrassment. I mean, he's an older guy. I'm a young woman. and Maybe I had afraid, was afraid to tell him. I don't really remember. But I remember when he called me, my first reaction was, oh, no, I've got to tell my malpractice carrier. And I stayed with the moment. And he said, I'm not going to sue you, but I want you to know so your next patient doesn't have the same thing happened. And so what would I have done differently? I would have gotten, I would have done a rectal exam. And so I, I sort of ask you to think then, perhaps write down for yourself what that story did for you, knowing the mistake that I made, and what affects your stories with mistakes you make, might have on others. Next slide, please. So another way to use stories is to create buy-in and excitement about a new initiative. Now, what's important to do is you have to start with the end in mind, collect with why, connect with why you're doing it, and with the listener's heart in mind. The other thing is, for stories like this, you really got to practice, even if it's just to your dog, because your dog won't, won't criticize you. Um, in a team coaching gig, I once asked, um, how would you like to start meetings on time and make sure everyone does his or her job? Again, just a question. And the solution they came with was, if we use, this is an OBGYN practice, if we do use OBGYN hospitalists will get home earlier and spend more time with our families. And if we start on time, we can end on time. So the goal for them was a combination of me as a team coach and with them to figure out what they wanted to do. So this is, an, again, another way to, cre is to create buy-in. Next slide, please. A third way is to build your team affiliation and identity. And this works, say, with your department, your specialty department. It can work with, say, the patient safety committee or anything. And it's important here to get feedback from the folks in the audience. How do they, what do they think of the team? What are their values? And how do they show up in the team work that they're doing? What's the reason? Or in coaching, as we say, for the sake of what? Encourage your team members to share their stories because that's a way to connect with them. Now, 
here's kind of a fun project, which is you can create a children's book about the team. You can talk about the history of the team, the makeup, what you've accomplished, and tell it as children's stories. And you can use your own photographs to advert to um, illustrate it, or you can get somebody to do line drawings. But it also gives sort of a record for the people that come after you to, to um, see what has gone before them. So the next one. Next slide, please. And the last piece is really stories or how you build relationships throughout your organization. Um, it's important here as you're, as you're listening to people's stories is to have them go first and listen for their meaning. So one of the things, one of my clients uh, was having a hard, was a chair of an ER department, a large academic medical center, and was having a hard time getting along with people. And one of his one of his beliefs was that he didn't have time, as he said, for cups of coffee. He didn't have time to talk with people. He didn't have time to go out and do the extra bit to get to know people. But once he did, once he did that, he told me that it really made a difference. He was getting along with the chief nursing officer and having a much better time of it. When you, build, when you listen to people, their stories, it's really important to be present and not do multitasking. And I'm sure that you remember your kids, your teenagers will often call you when you're, trying to, you're multitasking or working on your cell phone as you're talking to them. And they will let you know they don't think you're paying attention. The other thing we want to, often want to do in the medical profession is fix it. So we often have a solution for people. Well, you could do this, you could do that. Or, hey, I remember when I had that, and it's important not to do that. Um, it's really about listening without judgment to their stories and having no expectations as to outcome. I had another, another patient who just by um, surgeon uh, from a name brand, Northeast Medical School, went to work in a very genteel organization and who you, that uses that uses physician's assistants as their first assists in surgery. And a new one came in, and he wasn't sure how to even approach this person. And I held up a mirror and tried to hold up a mirror, as a coach does, to get him to suggest something, and he, he just couldn't do it. And I finally said to him, what would happen if you sat down next to him in the male changing room, put your hand on his arm or his shoulder, and said, hey, we're going to be working together what works for your schedule for us to get together? And there was a dead silence. I thought he'd hung up on me. What it, and he finally came back and said, wow, I never thought of that. And what I said to him was, you know, by this time we knew each other pretty well, I said, one of your challenges is people think you lie and you're a jerk. And you know that's not true, and I know that's not true. But they don't know that's true. And if you do this, I will guarantee you within 20 minutes, the story that people have of you in the operating room will change. And he could scarcely wait to tell me at our next coaching session what had happened, and he was, he was very thrilled. A key word here is to, a key concept here is to use the what questions. If you use yes or no questions, you force people into trying to figure out more about what you want. The same with how questions. But with what questions, it opens up. And a phrase I like to use is just, tell me some more. Next slide, please. For all of the, when you work with people, remember to make your audience the hero. You're the person on the left. I mean, the audience is the person on the left, Luke Skywalker. And the reason these are not, these are um, free images. Like, um, you have to pay to use the ones that are the real <laughs> actors. So. Um, Luke Skywalker is the hero, and he's your audience. And you're Yoda. You're there to listen, to coach, to be present with them. OK, last slide. Thank so, you so much. Um, and with that, we can move into question and answer. If anyone has any questions, um, you can feel free to chat in our inbox, or David, if you can open line. Absolutely. If you'd like to ask an audio question at this time, you may do so by pressing star 1 now. At this time, we have no audio questioners in the queue. I have a question. I have a question for, for Tara. This is Maggie. <laughs> Hi, Maggie. 
Hi. So I'm really curious. That stuff you did with the brain imaging, that is fascinating. So if I think I'm understanding you right, that with stories, more areas light up. Yes. Your, your sensory cortex area lights up with more vivid and descriptive stories. And it creates the same kind of experience as if you were in real in the real world perceiving some type of sensory experience, like the smell of hot chocolate. So, it, so how does, so, mm-hmm. so I was just gonna say how does that how does that work with our memory? Does it enhance it for the experience? Help me understand that. Well I'm not sure I mean, that would be a good guess. I'm not sure if that, therefore, etches it into our memory more. Um, I just know in terms of our response to it, our response to stories, we are, we are responding as if it is a full sensory experience, differently than if we were just saw a list of, you know, items on a, you know, a grocery list. Mm-hmm. Well, we just got a question from Tracy Duberman about aligning youth storytelling for motivating your team for an organizational change you aren't aligned to. You know, this is a great question. She asked that yesterday in the prep, and I have it in my notes and forgot to say it. First of all, it's critical with physicians. We're often taught to, um, as I mentioned, is fix it, and we're taught to advocate for our, for our departments or organization, our departments ourselves, our patients. It's important with this that you're in a leadership role, you're advocating for your organization, which means you can use a story, to, a story to share without having to say, I don't really believe in this, which isn't something you should do as the leader, but a story that you can use to help them understand why this is good. It will help with patience. It will give you more time. Um, you can think about whatever the result is, but it's really important. It's, very, it's a skillful use of your time rather than just saying something like, I don't agree with it either, but we have to do it. Weave a story, practice a story, go back to the five P's, make sure you have the people, place, et cetera. Um, and you can have, you know, the problem and then the solution. Yes. Thank you. We and have I, a speaker from, oops, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just looking at a bunch of questions that came in. My yeah. connectivity keeps going in and out, so now a whole bunch of questions came in, but do we have another question that you were going to say? Yeah, I'm going to read out a question for you both. Dina asked about, um, she asked, so kinesthetic learners are more likely to learn from vivid stories. Is that correct? That's a good question. I'm, I'm going to throw that to Tara, and then I'll give you the <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, again, I, I, I don't know for sure, but that would, I would make the same conclusion. That makes sense to me. But Maggie, I'll, I'll kick it back so over to you. Sure. As I understand storytelling, it's the more vivid. It doesn't matter if you're kinesthetic learners or you're any of the learners that either Howard Gardner or Edward Hall talks about, that the vivid stories help to, as I understand from what Tara said, help to put it in your brain sort of like a hologram in multiple places so that it would work better for anyone. I would, I mean, if I were to think about it, I would think that kinesthetic learners might be more motivated by imagining themselves moving. I'm, try, I'm a kinesthetic learner, so I'm trying to, try to think about what motivates me. But I like to find, you know, I fire on all cylinders. And I think that, that I mean, I think that's a really good question. It's, and I don't have a for, sure, for certain answer. I do know that vivid images help anybody learn better. We have a question from Darren. He said, I strongly believe in the power of telling stories. When telling the story on a program or a project, how do you weave in metrics or stats in an interesting way? Brilliant question. First of all, um, make sure there's there's a number of good books about how you. There's one, wake me when the wake me up when the data is over. There's another one, don't be such a scientist. It's really important to have graphics so that people can look at the statistics or the metrics at one play, it, you know, sort of one shot, because our brains, um, our brains make more sense out of that. The other thing is, as you go, you start with what you want to talk about. You sort of, it's sort of like going to one side to tell the story, back to the main point, go to the other side and use the statistics, the numbers, come back to the main point, go to the storytelling. So I think it's weaving it in with the storytelling. You're not as precise, but you can tell a story and then put the stats on in a graph to show what you just spoke about. Is that, does, Darren, does that, does that work for you? 
Yes, he says, yes, thank you. Um, David, we have a qu uh, question, uh, someone who would like to speak over the air. Yes, we have an audio question from Kathy Lynn Terry. Hi, I was wondering, what if you don't have a story? How do you remember stories, create stories, so that you can use them more often? Oh, Kathy, that's a brilliant question. So can you stay on the line? Yes. OK, so tell me what you do. Uh, I am a physician coach, and I'm also a psychiatrist. OK, so can you tell me a story about some time when you coached somebody and they had a breakthrough? Uh, yes. <clears throat> I was talking with a woman who um, was very irritable at work, and she was working a, a really harsh shift. And as we talked not only about the needs of the people that she was working with to communicate with them, she got an insight into her own needs. And she called me back the next week so excited, said she would had a breakthrough, and that she was scheduling some activities for herself. And that was allowing her to be less uh, reactive and harsh with the people she worked with. So how would you use that story? That's your own story. It's a very good story. How would you use that? Well, I guess I could use it multiple ways. If someone, uh, if, if I was working with a physician with burnout, I could use that in talking to them about um, how to renew themselves. Uh, I could use it uh, with physician leaders, both in terms of thinking about their own needs and their needs with their staff. Um, I could use it uh, with educating physician trainees. Uh, what may happen if they lose sight also of their needs. Um, those are just three quick thoughts. Right. And that's, that's how you take the stories that you have and you use them to illustrate points. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, yes. And so you have you, thousands of stories within you. I will guarantee you that. Do you sit and uh, ponder stories about subjects that you think are going to come up with clients and then have those at the ready? The best, I think the best thing is to do to either dictate into your smartphone or have a little, I carry around a little book you know, that I can write in. And when something comes up, I just jot a few words down to remind me of the story. And there's a lot of story, you know, mostly I, I, I don't usually know exactly the stories I'm going to tell when I need them. It's they come up in the, in the, in the system, in the circumstances. And so as you, as you keep doing this, that will happen to you. But in the beginning, start, then I still do this, start thinking about writing down something. So you had an interaction with a patient that was good or bad, or you had something that just absolutely engaged you and let you know that you were operating at your best. It was a moment you'd like to remember. Just dot, jot down a few words, put it on your computer, have a file with various stories, and review them from time to time. That's a great idea. Thank you. Sure. At this time, no other audio questions. Great, thank you. So we have a, another question from Richard, similar to Darren, about um, statistics and a story. He asked, do you have guidelines on how to mix these elements, use statistics when needed uh, to make the story effective, or is this, could this possibly be another lecture topic? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'll send, you your, I'll send you your check later, Richard. Um, that's a good question. Um, so people have an attention span of about 20 minutes um, when, you're, when you're giving lectures. Think of all the medical school lectures we've been to. Nobody ever thought 20 minutes was good for us. But judge your audience by that, 15 to 20 minutes, and bring in something, have them do something, tell a story. But there's no hard guidelines because it depends on your style and what the goals are for your audience. I will say that stories, um, if you're with a bunch of um, engineers, you might want to go more to statistics. Maybe. I don't know. It depends on the engineer group. If you're with a group, say, of storytellers or coaches, you might have more of a mixture. 
And if you're with a group of kids, right, grade school kids, I'd probably lose the statistics. Right. Another question also related to this is uh, Catherine said it seems that, that sometimes people go on and on and their stories may lose their effectiveness. Is there a time frame that is ideal? So Maggie, you mentioned about a shorter time uh, attention span. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think um, as I'm listening to these, it's, it's really a matter of knowing your audience. And if people go on and on with stories, it depend, you know, if you're stuck there listening, I mean, there's really nothing you can do but to learn from it, right? And I think that the time frame, depending on the audience, is when you stop and people wish you had more to tell them. Uh, Jen has a question. She asked, in what context have you used reading fiction to boost empathy, for example, in healthcare teams? Oh, that's a great idea. Well, I teach a class in reflective writing at Georgetown Med School, and we do use fiction as well as nonfiction. So if you consider my class my team, that's how we do that. It seem like we have any other questions in the chat. Uh, we just uh, want to remind everyone that the slides and the Recording of the presentation will be available early next week, and there will be an email out to everyone. Oh, Darren asked any examples of fiction to use. Well, um, let's throw that back to the audience. What do you guys think? What are some ideas for fiction you like? We'll give some people some time to think. See some yeah, we've got some think. folks typing. Uh, uh, Dina Brake sticks to nonfiction. Okay. Raymond Carver. Okay. I mostly stick to nonfiction by people such as Atul Gawande or Pauline Chen mm -hmm. or Perry Class or um, Daniel Offrey. Um, ooh, mysteries. I like mysteries too. Morse. Any British mysteries? Oh, Midsummer Murders. All right. <laughs> Detective or mystery? Well, it looks like we don't have any other questions coming in. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Again, just a reminder, we will be posting this recording and slides on our website by early next week. We'll also be sending out an email with an evaluation and a link to the slides. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. Great. And Can I say that, one more thing? You go ahead. Take improv classes. They're fabulous to learn how to react in the time. And the other thing is look up, take a course in screenwriting. I've taken the one by McKee, M-C-K-E-E. -E. He has a book called Story. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay. And with that, that concludes today's webinar. Thank you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's presentation. You may log off your webinars, disconnect your phone lines, and thank you for